Hey Art Nerds, today we're taking a look at the Van Gogh Dusk Colors. These were sent to me thanks to Kabocha. Thank you so much Kabocha for sending me these to check out. They were first mentioned in the paint box by Kabocha and Bomber B who were able to get a hold of them and B was kind enough to provide swatches. The swatches had me really intrigued. Kabocha kindly offered to send me hers as she wasn't going to use them and I leapt at the chance. In B's notes on the server, he pointed out that PVK was present in all dust colors and in Daniel Smith's Lunar Black. There was some musing as to whether or not one could recreate a similar effect at home. So today we're going to take a look at the four dusk colors available. Van Gogh has been releasing all sorts of really neat specialty sets. Some are more available than others. I think Blick has a pretty complete listing of the different specialty sets. In the past, I reviewed the 12 half pan pocket box that you guys see here. I picked that up at um, David's Art Supply in Metairie, Louisiana. So we have four total colors. We have Dusk Pink, Dusk Violet, Dusk Yellow, and Dusk Green. Three of those colors are available for $4.95 on Amazon. They're available in tubes and half pans, with Dusk Green being available for $8.79, which is kind of crazy. They are $2.87 on Blick and $2.89 on Jerry's. And I'll have links to all of those in the description below for you to shop with the place that is best for you. There are four total colors. So, Dusk Pink is a semi-opaque. It is 373G. It uses PBK11 and PV19. It's Series 1 and has a light fastness of 3. And I have a feeling the light fastness is going to be based on the main color used in these. These are all two color pigments with one color being PBK. Dusk Violet is semi-opaque, 560G. PBK11, PV23. It's Series 1 and it has a light fastness of 4. Dusk Yellow is semi-opaque, 230G. It uses pigments PBK11 and PY128. It's Series 1 and it has a light fastness of 2. And Dusk Green is also semi-opaque. 630G uses pigments PBK11, PG7. It's Series 1 and it has a light fastness. I have to double check this against the tube because like, I just can't believe this. A light fastness of 1. Yeah, wow. These are made by Royal Talons. The swatch you see there was provided kindly by Kabocha, and it really sells these paints. I think it was on hot press paper. So today I'm going to do a regular unboxing swatch, and I also want to compare these paints to some of the other paints I have that these make me think of, like the Boku Undo Sumi-esque paints right here. I've reviewed those on the channel, so I'll link the full review down in the description below. So we're going to start with a regular unboxing swatch. We're going to swatch on Fluid 100 watercolor paper. We're going to swatch on Shizen Cold Press, very textured paper. Shizen Hot Press, slightly less textured. The Artesia Watercolor Sketchbook, which has this really weird, I find it off-putting texture, kind of like laid linen. And then the B Mixed Media Sketchbook. I also want to compare these paints to Boko Undo, as well as to some popular granulating colors. And then finally, since we did kind of wonder if we could mix some of our own using a little bit of Daniel Smith's Lunar Black, aka PBK11, we want to try mixing some of our own dusk colors here at home. I also want to allow the dusk colors to dry in half pans and try reconstituting them. Since for me, if I can't reconstitute two paints in half pans, I'm probably not going to use those paints. That's just the way that I paint here. So as I mentioned, these paints were generously provided by Kabocha for the purposes of review, but this review was also made possible thanks to the generosity of my patrons on Patreon. So if you enjoy what I do, if you find it helpful, useful, and informative, if you like my reviews, if you enjoy my tutorials, one way you can help me continue to create this sort of content and release it regularly is to join me over on Patreon at patreon.com slash natosoup. So these are some of the granulating colors I also want to swatch just to compare. Several of the uh, Daniel Smith Fine Tech slash Genuine Pigments. So these are the ones that use a lot of the general, or I'm sorry, Genuine 
minerals and genuine gemstones, as well as undersea green, Windsor Newton smalt blue, and Coors ultramarine blue. So let's go ahead and get started with our swatching. I'm going to do a granulate, graduated wash swatch. That way we can kind of see how the pigments settle out. I'm also going to do a mass tone swatch. And we're going to be testing for opacity in this swatching. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to lay down some black lines using a black alcohol marker. This should be non-water reactive and it should provide no resist to the water color. So for all of these swatches, I'm going to work directly from the tubes. Um, in some instances, I may apply it to my Teflon craft mat that you guys see there. But in the beginning, I try doing it directly from the tubes. And I'm using a fairly soft synthetic brush. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for these paints to replicate what I see in the swatch provided by Kabocha, which is really good color saturation and also a really interesting and strong granulation of the PBK11, because that's the most interesting part of these paints. I mean, I think we've got like a Quinn Magenta, that would be dusk pink. We've got maybe a dioxine purple, that would be dusk violet. For the yellow, uh, your guess is as good as mine. I would say maybe Aeolian. Actually, you guys would know because you guys are going to check the pigment and let me know down in the comments below. And then dust green is kind of like a viridian green, right? So none of those colors on their own. They're all very useful colors on their own, but they're not the most flashy colors. But the addition of the PBK11 makes them very interesting colors. Now, this set, I would not use this set on the regular. This is a special effects set. It could be used for really fun monochrome. It could be used to add special effects or a final glaze of color, but I wouldn't mix this heavily with other colors. And this set personally would not enter, say, my seven inch Kara painting set. However, because these colors offer some really interesting special effects and because the tubes are fairly cheap, with the most expensive being 879, which was the Outlier, and that's on Amazon, um, but ranging from 495 to 287, they're really affordable enough that if you just want to kind of play around with watercolor, they could be a good option. So for swatching on Fluid 100, while wet, my swatches don't seem to gradu granulate as much as kabochas, but granulation increases as the water evaporates and the pigments seem to settle down. So upon first swatching, they're not going to seem that granulated, let them dry. For lighter washes, sedimentation is minimal, giving the color a dirty cast to it. This probably gives better results at stronger concentrations. It could also be an issue of the water that I'm using. I'm using Nashville Tap, and that's what I use for most of my unbox and swatch videos. In fact, all of them that are recorded in Nashville, which can sometimes change the properties of the paint once dry. When I'm in Louisiana, I work with distilled water because sediments in the water make paints dry with a chalky coating. I'm not sure about the quality of Kabocha's water, but it seems to work well with the dust colors. I believe her swatch set was on Stonehenge Hot Press. So now I'm doing a direct application of the paint to my craft mat since I was having trouble getting strong enough um, saturations. I also did a swatch of the Daniel Smith Lunar Black, our PBK11, just for comparison and as a control. I feel like I'm having trouble achieving mass tone swatches, so I'm going to try something a bit more drastic, which is this application here. At full mass tone saturation in piles, the color appears almost black. You can barely tell pink from purple from yellow from green. Working this way, I was able to get a more saturated mass tone.
When dry, some colors in mass tone are kind of glossy, but not sticky to the touch. My swatch swatches aren't as vibrant as kabochas, which is annoying as that vibrancy is what attracted me to these paints. The sedimentation isn't as nice on my swatches either. Later in the video, I am going to do a lift test and we'll talk about that in a bit. So next I'm swatching on Shizen Cold Press. I was really hoping that this very textured watercolor paper would provide um, more visual interest and more areas for the sediment to fall into. So there's lots of divots for sedimentation to soak into. The paper stays wet so you can layer on the color to softly build up uh, gradual shifts and I'll check in with you guys towards the end of the video wow into the video after these swatches when the paper has had a chance to dry to give you my thoughts on this paper apologies I will have the show notes that's all my thoughts typed up either down in the description below or linked in a google doc if you're having trouble following my words I may also share this as a blog post at natosoup.com slash wait not natosoup.com natosoup.blogspot.com so um, I applied my initial gradual wash and now I'm just adding some additional color wet into wet and letting it blend in because I was really hoping to achieve that higher saturation of color. Next up is Shizen Hot Press. I really like painting on Shizen Hot Press. It doesn't quite behave like a hot press so much as like a mild mannered, slightly textured cold press. And I was, I had high hopes for this paper as well. So sedimentation while wet is more noticeable than on the cold press paper. Working properties are pretty similar to Shizen Cold Press other than it has less texture. And as with the cold press, I'll check in later on once this has had a chance to dry. And I have reviews of both She's in Hot Press and She's in Cold Press, as well as a comparative review, I believe, if you're interested in this handmade, very affordable cotton rag watercolor paper, and you'd like to learn more about it. So now I'm swatching on the Arteza watercolor sketchbook. I actually really don't like this paper. I don't like the texture of this paper. Um, it is a cellulose watercolor sketchbook, but I definitely wanted to try these on a variety of papers that would have a variety of textures because I really thought texture would help bring out the sedimentation. So a well mixed wash of each color goes down surprisingly smooth on this paper. Blending it out with clean water makes for kind of an ugly gradient. Due to the regular and fairly even texture of the paper, sedimentation occurs, but in a regular pattern, which is kind of neat. And then finally, the B Mixed Media Paper. This is a mixed media paper, so it's designed to work with a variety of media, including watercolor. I have done swatches on this paper before, and it is a cotton rag mixed media paper. Color separates out more noticeably on this paper, particularly the pink, the yellow, and the green. The pink highlights up to magenta, which is the base color. The yellow is like a chartreuse and the green is like a blue green. So the actual colors used are much more noticeable on the B paper. For she's in cold press, sedimentation is interesting on this paper, but not as striking as I had hoped. Colors are kind of weak. Washout is interesting, but maybe difficult to control. For she's in hot press, just really weak and unimpressive. Looks dirty more than like sedimentation. 
for the Arteza watercolor paper. Base colors are more prominent, particularly the yellow and the green. Sedimentation is a bit sooty, but not as dirty looking as the sheets in hot press. It's tolerable on this paper. The washes are more uniform and look less dirty. On the B paper, it just looks gross, frankly. Very patchy and unimpressive and kind of nasty. Okay, so next up, we're going to compare the Van Gogh dust colors to some similar products. None of them are exactly like the dust colors, but they feature similar properties that I thought would be interesting for comparison. So we're going to start with some baseline swatches. It's going to make it easier to compare. And this was swatched on Fluid 100 watercolor paper, the same as our initial swatch. And it is a cotton rag water paper, watercolor paper, very mild mannered and fairly affordable. And it's also pre-stretched on the block, which makes it easier to use. Now, I'm not really going to be doing a whole lot of gradient washing with this. I'm basically going for kind of a good mass tone mix, and we're just going to compare the properties from there. So we're starting with the Van Gogh dusk colors, dusk pink, dusk violet, dusk yellow, and dusk green. So the Boko Undo Sumi-esque colors are Gansai style watercolors. The colors are finely milled. There's very little sedimentation. These are Gansai, so they utilize a different binder and are designed to be painted on thickly and a bit opaque. Only a couple colors in this set split out into individual pigments when water is added. The color gamut, though, is the same. They're both supposed to be shadow colors. These are supposed to be Sumi colors, so colors that if you mix Sumi ink, you would achieve these colors. But how the two brands handle that is very different, and I really like the dynamic between the two. I actually really like the color selection in the Sumi-esque set because I happen to like desaturated shadow colors a whole lot. And that's one of the things that drew me to the Dusk set. I wanted to see how Van Gogh was going to handle that, and I thought the addition of the PBK-11 makes for a really interesting special effect paint. So there is some water blowback in these swatches, which leads to interesting color chromatography. I wish um, they were kind of uniform across the line. And I quickly flashed a piece of art or a couple of pieces of art that I did using the Boku Undo colors. So next, we're going to try some granulating non-shadow colors from Daniel Smith, Windsor, Newton, and Core. There's a lot of fine tech colors in here, as well as a smalt and an ultramarine. So all of these are colors I selected because they tend to be very granulating. And I'm starting with Lunar Black, which is the PBK11 that is used in the dusk colors. And this is what kind of led us to believe we could mix our own. Next is undersea green. This is one of my favorite colors. And on the right paper, it has some really beautiful granulation with cool greens and yellow greens and even blues. On this paper though, didn't want to granulate so much. It likes to granulate on arches though. So this is not necessarily the best demonstration of what undersea green is capable of. Next, we have a fine tech color. I think it's Piemontite Genuine. So this is made from a gemstone, even though it might be a more minor gemstone. And the fine tech colors tend to be very prone to granulation. I am washing these out just a little bit to give you guys an idea of how they sediment. Next is Bronzite Genuine, and this one has a lot of sparkle to it. So this one can be a little bit more difficult to use because it's almost like applying a glitter paint to your paper. It brings a lot of sparkle to the table. After that is Hematite Genuine, which um, B put it in the chat that they always laugh because it's a little bit like someone sprinkled pepper on the paper. I have to agree. This is more sedimentation than it is actual anything. And I'm not really sure how other artists use this paint and maybe they mix it with whatever they're using for that sedimentation. Next is Appetite Green Genuine. This is another really nice sedimenting color. If you guys can hear those birds outside my window, I think some crows built a nest outside my window and they're fussing at me.
trying to encourage that sedimentation. And next is Windsor & Newton Smalt Blue. So smalt's really interesting because it's made up of ground glass. And depending on your smalt and depending on your paper, you can get a lot of granulation out of it. It's also just a really, really pretty color of blue. And finally, we have Core. I think it's actually ultramarine blue violet, not just ultramarine blue. I have a lot of ultramarines that tend to be very granulating. Some of them even tend to be so granulating that they look muddy. So I thought a, an ultramarine would be a good pick here. So next we're gonna do a little bit of wet into wet testing with some salt. And partially we're going to do that because it's fun, it's interesting, these have interesting granulation. I think they can provide a lot of interesting surface texture when we sprinkle in the salt. And again, I'm working on Fluid 100 watercolor paper. And I do want to point out with these watercolor tests, it does get kind of expensive because I do try to test my watercolors on cotton rag papers. I want to give them the best chance possible, so I tend to apply them to nicer papers. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm saturating my paper with water because I want those pigments to really disperse. I want that sedimentation to happen. And I'm just gonna add in a mix of the four different colors. I'm not really trying to paint anything with this. I'm just trying to demonstrate how the salt's gonna look. And I'm also trying to, dis to demonstrate how the colors might mix a little bit. I have a feeling these are gonna turn to straight up mud if you mix them too much. And I can't imagine these doing well with a lot of layering. Partially because it's just gonna, with, with sedimenting colors, if you do a lot of layering, they tend to start to look kind of dirty. So you wanna keep it kind of light and kind of fresh. If you're a fan of my normal watercolor style, these would not work with that style. So if you're a, someone who does a lot of layering, these are probably not the watercolor for you. And I have my salt in a little Dollar Tree container. It actually works quite well because it allows me to keep kosher salt on hand for these kinds of effects. And I find kosher salt works really well for this because you get those big flaky salt flakes, honestly. So I'm going to allow this to dry off camera and we'll check back in with it. So now we're going to be mixing our own and I selected some colors that I thought would work well with this. We have a phthalo blue, we have a naphthamide marine, a maroon, sorry. We have a dioxine purple, we have a quin magenta and we have a phthalo green yellow shade. I wasn't trying to mix up like perfect dupes of the colors. I'm just trying to mix up interesting colors. So we're using Holbein's Thalo Blue Yellow Shade. We're using Daniel Smith's Naphthamide Maroon. We're using M. Graham's Dioxine Purple. We're using Core Quin Magenta and M. Graham's Thalo Cyanine, yeah, Cyanine Green Yellow. And this is really easy to do. I was just being lazy about it. I just put a dot of the Lunar Black. Um, and I still got really nice mixes. And as I said earlier, I used DS's Lunar Black for these mixes. All mixed fairly easily with the Lunar Black. You can see I'm just doing surface mixing on my non-pore surface. I'm not really taking any precautions or trying to be exact with this. Some have more interesting sedimentation than others. The Dioxine Purple and the Thalo Cyanine Green, which are both M. Grams, are my favorite mixes for these. But I feel like that's more personal preference because they tended to create more shadow colors. The Holbein Thalo Blue and the Core Quin Magenta deliver really vivid co color if what you like is that mix of the granulating black and the really bright color underneath. Mixing a little lunar black in with your primary color can deliver a lot of nice texture and can generate a really lovely shadow color. So the homemade mixes seem a lot nicer than the real deal, like all of them, but I particularly like the two M grams. So doing a lift test with these is really important. I figure these are probably very prone to lifting. The materials I'm gonna use for the lift test are a cup of clean water and a synthetic brush, as well as a clean paper towel. We're just gonna scrub a scrub, just a little bit, dab, dab, and see if they lift. 
So all of these colors seem fairly prone to lifting. The Quin Magenta did stain, which makes sense. That would be the Dusk Pink. However, the Daniel Smith was actually fairly staining, which was a little bit surprising. So these dust colors are going to be somewhat prone to lifting. I have a feeling they would be very prone to reactivating, which is one of the reasons I cannot recommend you use them with glazes on top of them. Maybe save them for the end of your watercolor painting or maybe do a watercolor painting with just these. So here I am just kind of examining the texture on different paper, checking out the sedimentation. I had really high hopes for sedimentation on the Shizen Cold Press. I was really disappointed that it didn't sediment out more. I was looking for something really, really striking. The Shizen Hot Press, you can see it kind of looks dirty, especially with the yellow. It's okay but not great on the Arteza cold press cellulose paper and then in my opinion it's just plain gross on the B mixed media papers. A lot of mixed media papers do not handle watercolor well and you really have to change how you handle your watercolor to get them to play nice on mixed media papers. And here's another look at our comparative colors. So with the fine tech and the granulating colors, undersea green usually gives lovely sedimentation, shading into blue and blue green, and that isn't apparent in this swatch for some reason. Some of the genuine pigments have a bit of sparkle to them, so you may wanna be careful about when you use them. Green Appetite has this really, really nice red sediment to it that can make it a lot of fun to paint with and can make it really useful for special effects. And I think the dust colors are the only ones that consistently have black sedimentation. And that's um, a very defining trait for them. It's basically just the black sedimentation and then the main body color. But they work best in stronger sediment, uh, in stronger mixes. Washes of these colors tend to look really dirty. And with the Boko Undo colors, I really like some of the blowback color chromatography we get, particularly with the blue and with the purple, how it kind of divides out into different colors. And as for our dried salt test, once the salt has been removed, and I used a soft drafting brush to do that, the salt reactions, particularly in the bottom right, are really pretty and striking. These could be a really fun use for these paints. So you can see in the bottom right how we have all these like salt blossoms. That's kind of where the highest concentration of salt was applied for these. Another look at our homemade mixes. I really can't state how easy these were to make. If you have PBK11, if you have Lunar Black and you don't mind using it for this purpose, you really don't need to go out and buy these tubes. You can get some really lovely colors by just mixing two colors at home. So the ability to dry these paints in half pans and then have them reconstitute is basically make or break for me. I'm not a tube watercolor person. I don't like just squirting out watercolor from a tube, letting it dry and reconstituting it. I have a cat, it ends up full of cat hair. What works best for me is working from half pans in a palette that I can shut. And even then it ends up 
full of cat hair. You guys can see the pile mask tones on these are basically all black, regardless of the color. So label your pans because you're not going to be tell be able to tell which is which after they've dried if you don't label your pans in advance. Even the yellow is basically black. That lunar black, that PBK11, is the most noticeable thing about these half pans. So one of the things I was kind of, I was kind of worried about two things. I was worried that the PBK would not reconstitute well, kind of like Daniel Smith's Mayan Blue. And I was also afraid that it was a heavier pigment and it would sink to the bottom of the pan and we'd be left with this weird color separation. So those were the things I was kind of looking out for when I started working with these pans. So I allowed these pans to dry for three days. That way we can get a good test of whether they're gonna reconstitute. And I wanna test these half pans on all the papers we used before. And I'm really looking to make sure the sedimentation is similar and the color saturation is similar, that the half pans do not degrade as they dry. I know some companies and some painters swear up and down do not dry tube watercolors in half pans. And while I have had some negative experiences with that, that's been one or two compared to the 10 years of positive daily experiences I've had with working with watercolors that have dried in half pans. So I'm pretty comfortable <laughs> with going about it this way. And I know a lot of other painters do this too. So I did not pre-activate these pans. I basically just stuck a wet brush in there as you guys can see me doing right now, swished it around to see how much it would pick up and they reconstitute really well. In fact, I find these a lot easier to use reconstituted than from the tubes. I wasn't getting the saturation I wanted with the tubes. I was having to do a lot of mixing and I felt like it was creating a lot of mess for me. The colors activate readily. They're easy to get a good mix on my brush. This is way better than the tubes. The dust pink looks a smidge darker and the granulation isn't as noticeable because it's better dispersed. So allowing these to dry in half pans gives you a new way to handle these paints. If you were struggling to use these paints straight from the tube, this might be a way better method for you. So the verdict on these Van Gogh dusk colors. The concept is a lot of fun, and I applaud Van Gogh for creating and releasing these really fun theme sets. The metallics and the interference colors seem like a lot of fun. I'm not so into the dust colors straight from the tube, but allowing them to set up in half pans gives me a better working experience. They reconstitute easily, you don't really need to pre-wet them, and the pigment disperse dispersal is more uniform in swatches, so it's not all black at the start. Washing out using the half pans is a cleaner wash than from the tube. I can't see these paints being useful in the way that I normally handle watercolor, but I do think they're great as special effects paints or to add something new to your watercolor techniques. You can easily create similar effects with a tube of Daniel Smith's Lunar Black PBK11 and the paint of your choice. I would recommend working more with single pigment colors for that. So while these paints are fun, there isn't really a need to go out and test them or go out and buy them, but they are pretty cheap. So if you see them at Jerry's, if you see them at Blick, they may be worth picking up. I want to thank Kabocha again for sending me these to check out, and thanks to Bomber B for bringing these to my attention. I had a lot of fun playing with them, and I would love to try out some of the other Van Gogh sets to see if they hold up. I do have a field test plan for these watercolors, but it's going to be a monochrome field test similar to the Boca Undo field test because that's my favorite aspect of these paints is the sedimentation that we're able to get. So I hope you guys are looking forward to that and I hope you guys will keep an eye on this channel. If you're not a subscriber yet, make sure you hit the subscribe button button and click that bell notification and it'll let you know when I update. I try to update at least twice a week, but often we go way more frequently than just twice a week. And every Saturday evening, I try to have a live workshop where I show you guys a technique or I teach you guys something brand new. So if you love learning along, if you want to come hang out, Saturday nights at 8 p.m. CST is the time and this is the place. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this 
useful, helpful, and inspirational. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a like. If you've got any questions or any comments about how I handled this, you can let me know down in the comments below. And I would really appreciate it if you took a moment to share this video to say Pinterest or to your Facebook or to your favorite social media. You sharing this video helps me grow as a channel and it helps me reach more people who would really benefit from this. If you're looking for some guided watercolor practice, please check out my watercolor basic series and my quick and easy watercolor series. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope to see you guys again really soon. Have a wonderful day, guys. Bye!